this week on the Back Table Podcast. Dr. Spinoza went to spend two weeks with Olia, who developed the uh, subintimal technique. And uh, he went and spent time with him to, to learn about subintimal crossing. And uh, during that time, he kind of had this idea that what if you did this just from both directions and in patients of which they cannot uh, re-enter, maybe creating a separate subintimal plane from a retrograde direction uh, would allow you to establish through and through access and then allow you to, to open up that artery. So it was completely his brainchild and uh, really his techniques, while the tools have changed, the real bread and butter of how he did that really hasn't changed a, a whole heck of a lot. We've gotten a, a little bit more creative slash aggressive with how we cross these, but all of the major tenets of how he established that technique are, are still in use today. Welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. For more than a decade, Reflow Medical has designed and engineered medical devices that respond to unmet clinical needs. The Wingman Crossing Catheter with its unique extendable beveled tip and an expanded indication for CTOs. The Specs LP, created to meet the need for a low-profile version of the Specs shapeable support catheter. And the new line of core catheters that answers the call for a suite of effective tools to use in challenging PCI procedures. BD understands that anything that can help to save time, space, and reduce complexity in the lab is essential. The Rotorex atherectomy system is simple to set up and easy to use, with a small plug-and-play capital component and reasonable handle that is easily draped. In a healthcare environment where costs matter, all device-related accessories are in each catheter set at no additional charge, including the Rotorex guidewire. This device is not for use in cardiopulmonary, coronary, cerebral, iliac, renal, or venous vasculature. To learn more, visit bd.com slash rotorex. Click the link in the podcast notes for instructions for use for indications, contraindications, hazards, warnings, and precautions. Now, back to the episode. I'm Dr. Ali Behetti coming to you from Tacoma, Washington, and my guest today is a, a friend of the show, Dr. Luke Wilkins. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. I appreciate it. Friend of the show. Is that like next level status? Is I think that like so, a bump yeah. up from just a guest? Okay, I'll take it. Yeah, take it, it. it's kind of like the gold MVP version of Backtable. <laughs> I feel like I should put it on my email signature. Exactly. Uh, he's coming to us from, uh, from Charlottesville, Virginia um, at the University of Virginia. Luke, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Okay, our topic today is the safari technique and procedure. We can jump right into it. Luke, for the uninitiated, what does Safari stand for? Uh, safari stands for subintimal arterial flossing with anti-grade retrograde intervention. And what are what are the tenets of the technique? So basically, the, the um, major reason for doing a safari is when you have a long segment chronic total occlusion or a CTO, um, and you are uh, unable or cannot enter from a anti-grade approach, re-enter the true lumen. That is. So there are a variety of, of uh, re-entry techniques and tools that are available, but there are frequently, uh, those uh, are not successful for getting back into the true lumen. Um, and uh, so you need another approach to be able to uh, cross these uh, long segment CTOs. I see. Okay. Can you go a little bit into the development of this technique? I'd love to talk a little bit about the history of the procedure and how it was developed at UVA. Sure, sure. So, um, full disclosure, uh, I was uh, not here at UVA uh, when uh, this technique was uh, developed. Uh, it was first published in 2005, and I think um, the folks that were here um, at UVA who developed the technique uh, started kind of in 2003, which is when I started med school. So, it was, it was a little bit ago. Um, and it was uh, one of the former interventionalists here, uh, Dave Spinoza, and I actually... Uh, um, Another full disclosure, uh, you should be, uh, uh, the person who should be talking about this is uh, either uh, Dave Spinoza or uh, Fritz Engel, and I'm just a, a lowly disciple. <laughs> well, gee, I guess I got to get them on the show now. <laughs> <laughs> but they're not friends of the show, so it doesn't, uh, it doesn't count. <laughs> so, uh, but so I, so I asked uh, Fritz about this, and this is something that we've talked a lot about, about a kind of development of Safari and, and how it all, all came about. And so the story is that um, Dr. Spinoza went to spend two weeks with Olia, who developed the uh, subintimal technique. And uh, he went and spent time with him to, to learn about uh, subintimal crossing. 
And uh, during that time, he kind of had this idea that what if you did this just from both directions and, and in patients of which they cannot uh, re-enter, maybe creating a separate subintimal plane from a retrograde direction uh, would allow you to establish through and through access and then allow you to, to open up that artery. So it was completely his brainchild, and um, he worked through a lot of the kinks of the procedure and completely uh, developed it and, and published his findings back in, in 2005. And uh, really his techniques, while the tools have changed, um, the, the real bread and butter of how he did that really hasn't changed a, a whole heck of a lot. We've gotten a, a little bit more creative slash aggressive uh, with, uh, with how we cross these, but all of the major tenets of how he established that technique are, are still in use today. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more technically. When you're starting, when you've decided you're going to do a safari procedure, your anti approach has failed, what tools do you need? Yeah. So um, first going through like an, an anti approach and, and failing, what does that mean? And so um, different people have different levels of tolerance for uh, how many the number of devices they will try to uh, re-enter the true lumen uh, prior to, uh, quote unquote, giving up and, and trying from a retrograde access. Um, I think uh, part of that depends on where the lesion is located, uh, level of calcification, how large the um, the true lumen is at the re-entry point, and probably what time of the day it is. Uh, so <laughs> all of those kind of factor into to whether or not you're going to access from below. So uh, my usual just kind of broad brush strokes, I would say I, I usually try a, if I'm unable to spontaneously re-enter into the true lumen, um, I will uh, try a re-entry device. My usual go-to is Outback. Um, if that is unsuccessful, I, I will consider um, possibly uh, using an a N-tier uh, balloon. And uh, then I usually have low threshold for just moving on and, and getting retrograde access. So uh, the usual, my usual approach is uh, accessing either a, a PT or a DP, depending on how the uh, lateral foot arteriogram looks. Um, I use a 4CM micropuncture needle, and I use a um, exchange length nitrex. So I use an exchange length because uh, in the event uh, that we are able uh, to get subintimal from below straight away through the needle, and uh, get up into the subintimal plane and get into the, uh, the same subintimal plane where you are uh, coming from an anti-grade direction, uh, then you don't want to have to go through the process of, process of exchanging for a longer wire. So that's why I use an exchange line. How often does that happen that you get back into the, the same subintimal plane from below as you are from above with your, with your access? Knowing, knowing my history, it happened once and therefore I'll never <laughs> ever like... not have an exchange line. <laughs> But yeah, it doesn't happen frequently, but it's mm -hmm. it's nice to have it there just in case. And usually what I do is get access, uh, nitrex up, um, it runs into a blockage, take needle off, and then I bear back a crossing catheter. My usual okay. go-to is CXI. Um, and so then I'll take the uh, CXI up to that, up to where the nitrex is kind of buckled, either at the level of the occlusion, the distal aspect of the CTO, or if it uh, happened to go into a subintimal plane, I'll take that crossing catheter into the subintimal plane, then I'll exchange out for a more appropriate uh, crossing wire. All right. So that's that's your below hardware. What do you have from above during this whole time? I've become a big fan of uh, telescoping catheters. Uh, mm -hmm. So I will have a sheath up and over or an uh, anti-grade sheath, depending. And uh, then through that, I will have a 035 and an 018 crossing catheter with the 018 crossing catheter inside of the 035. Telescoping CXIs work well for this purpose and um, give you a lot of uh, stability and pushability for uh, going in the subminimal space. So usually that's what I have from above. It also is very helpful because there are times where you get into the same subintimal plane. And if you have your 035 catheter all the way within that subintimal plane, you can draw back your 018 catheter that's telescoped inside and sneak your wire from below into that 035 catheter and not have to break out a snare. Got it. Got it. Makes sense. All right. You mentioned this earlier. I'd love to get past the the broad brush strokes of a couple of things. When do you pick what kind of reentry device? When do you start with your outback, or when do you say I'm going to go with an end tier? So I usually only try the end tier if the the outback has failed. I um, almost always use an outback first, and I would say that that has a if I'm going to get true lumen access and, and be able to reenter from from an anti grade approach. That has my highest likelihood of getting success. I feel like that 
while you need some degree of calcification to provide a fluoroscopic guidance for the outback, the amount of calcification is almost that amount of calcification or that level of calcification is almost always present in these patients. So you can almost always have something to help guide where you're going to direct your cannula for reentry into the true lumen. I see. Okay. And then you mentioned something about location of where you're of where you've gone subintimal and where you want to reenter. Could you go into that a little bit more? Yeah, sure, sure. So um, there are many times where we uh, cross from anti-grade approach and we get into the subintimal plane and your CTO extends to an important branch vessel, be it a um, most likely a, a takeoff of the of the AT. Um, and so uh, you don't want to extend your dissection plane past uh, your takeoff of your AT and, and risk clip of that vessel. So in those cases, it, it helps to get subintimal from below as well and not even attempt true lumen re-entry from above. Mm. Something I run into when I do safaris is I'm often in two different subintimal planes. Can we talk a little bit about techniques for getting into the same subintimal plane or reconnecting your two devices? Sure. So there's a, there are some established uh, techniques for doing that. Um, something that uh, a lot of people find success with that I don't, I don't do quite as much in my practice, but it has been, has had some success is to bring uh, balloons from both below and above and a uh, balloon adjacent to each other. This can create a uh, rents within the uh, subintimal planes that then can establish through and through uh, crossing. Usually I find that just with enough guide wire and catheter manipulation and changing uh, wires, you can get into new subintimal planes from either above or below and that can and help uh, those two access points, help those access points kind of communicate Frequently, if I, I usually start just where they both happen to meet, um, and then if I can't get those both antegrade and the retrograde to uh, meet in the same place, then I usually move up the CTO, but go more proximal within the CTO, um, and see if there is somewhere within the subintimal planes that you can establish access. So usually somewhere along there. I try and tell our, all our trainees that every CTO can be crossed, um, and you should have that as your... Um, as your kind of mantra when you're approaching these is that every CTO can be crossed. And if you are unsuccessful, it's because you gave up too early. Um, and uh, it just requires more work and trying different techniques. Um, we've had, I think, somewhere between uh, around a half a dozen uh, cases where we we're unable to uh, get the, the two access points to meet. Um, so we tried everything, ballooning, getting a sharp re-entry, either um, this is uh, something I didn't talk about, but it, besides just ballooning, um, you can uh, use uh, re-entry devices in the subanimal plane to create new uh, channels within that subanimal plane. Um, so you could bring a snare from below and an outback from above um, and then aim for that uh, area and that helps create a, a new track. Uh, but you do have to make sure that you're in that subintimal space from the retrograde. So retrograde subintimal space and uh, out back in a subintimal space and then get those two to meet. So we've had several instances, several cases where we were unable to get that to happen despite all of our uh, myriad techniques. Um, and we've uh, done a gun sight approach for those. A gun sight is when you bring a snare from below a snare from above and put those in roughly the same kind of plane. Um, and then you uh, rotate your uh, II so that those two snares are are lined up like a gun sight. And then from outside, so from a, a percutaneous approach, you bring a needle through a, a one snare and then through the other. And then through that needle, pass a wire, and then you can snare it from above, pull it through, and snare it from below and pull it through. Um, and that helps you establish through and through access. There's lots of variations on that technique to make sure that it's uh, safe for flipping the wire and not dragging a stiff end of a wire out through your um, retrograde vessels, but but that's a little bit more aggressive approach for um, a, yeah. a safari. Gunsight in general, globally, is God's gift to IR. I feel like when when all else fails, gunsight will get you there. Yeah, um, the, uh, the name of it is a little aggressive, but it's <laughs> apropos, so... <laughs> Just a couple technical details about gun sight. Do you use your excess needle, your um, micropuncture needle, when you go through your two snares? Yes, I uh, uh, have uh, used that before. Um, I'm trying to think if there's if I've ever used a longer than a micropuncture needle because it was deep or the patient uh, 
patient body habitus. I don't think I have. I think every time it's been just a micropuncture needle. And going through the gun sight technique, what kind of needle do you like to use to access between the snares? I think almost all cases I've uh, used just our standard uh, 7CM micropuncture needle uh, for that. Mm -hmm. And then um, what wire do you put through it? I think in almost all instances, I uh, use a command wire. Um, you know, typically I don't like uh, placing a, a wire with a hydrophilic coating through a uh, needle because you can shear off that, that hydrophilic coating. Um, but in, in this instance, when you're snaring it and pulling it through, if you do something that uh, doesn't have a hydrophilic co- uh, coating, it, it can, um, the tip of the wire can become dislodged. So I, uh, use that, um, that uh, uh, I usually use a command 014. Um, that uh, typically works well. Also of note, um, when things I've learned uh, during using gun sight for this approach is that frequently it's it's challenging to tell if you've actually gone through the snare. You think it'd be really easy to tell on fluoroscopy if you've actually gone through the snare. So what I've found to be helpful, so you don't go through the whole of the rigmarole and then realize that you didn't actually go through the snare, um, is that after I get needle through and through where I think the snares are located, uh, then I'll cinch up the snares on the needle itself and just say that way I can tell like, oh yeah, I've, I'm where I need to be. And then I'll put the um, the wire through and then be able to grab both sides. I see. Okay. Do you use standard snares for this or uh, what size snares do you usually use? Um, I use uh, micro snares for these. Uh, so I, uh, I believe they're four millimeter snares. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, I think uh, we hit most of the things I wanted to talk about. Um, oh, uh, pedal access. Do you use a radial cocktail when you put your pedal sheet in? I do not. I saw that you had that that question written down, and and I I, I tell you, I I don't use any cocktail uh, okay. down in the uh, pedal side. I think that there are uh, uh, endovascular procedure lists who um, do a lot of pedal access and um, are very strong advocates uh, for uh, treating from a a pedal approach. And you know, I think that the literature is is kind of still in development for for doing a lot of these endovascular procedures from from a pedal approach but i do think that it likely has merit in a variety of uh, circumstances um however uh, we have uh, found with safari that we have in these patients that have uh clti and have such advanced peripheral arterial disease uh, we keep the access site as small as possible um so uh, we're not placing an occlusive sheath uh, in these we're just bare backing a, a catheter um, and then frequently, once I get uh, through and through access and we've moved on to the treatment portion, I back that crossing catheter off of our retrograde access and I um, just use the inner of a micropuncture um, with a check flow on it. Um, okay. And uh, that's my only access. So we try and keep it as small as possible. Um, it is extremely important uh, for these patients to be uh, well anticoagulated. ACTs are uh, uh, north of 250. Um, on these patients, usually close to 280. Um, and uh, we usually pull the retrograde access while the patients are still anticoagulated um, and uh, use a light fellow seal at the, <laughs> at the access site. And uh, sometimes um, these uh, require uh, ballooning at the uh, access site. So something that I've started doing, I think since, since you were here, uh, Allie, is um, getting my Uh, trying to ditch my retrograde access as quickly as possible because we've been burned with access site complications um, in the uh, tibial vessels. Um, So uh, that can be challenging, though, in these patients that are really diseased because you might have a, even the inner of the micropuncture can be occlusive in these vessels when you add on vessel spasm. Um, So I uh, will come from antigrade, take a crossing catheter, all the way uh, to the level of the retrograde access where the inner of the micropuncture is located. I will uh, ditch that through and through uh, wire, uh, flip it around so that then I have the floppy tip going in the correct direction through the antigrade access. And then from the retrograde access, I will put a nitrex wire just to the end of the micropuncture, the inner of the micropuncture. Um, This uh, blocks that entry site into the micropuncture, um, which you have to do in order to get around the micropuncture. Otherwise, your needle or your wire from the antigrade approach will just continue to go into the lumen of the micropuncture. So you have to block it up. So once I do that, then I get all the way across uh, into the uh, pedal arch. And uh, then I bring a balloon down, um, bring a balloon to where uh, covering the access site. 
pull the uh, retrograde access and then balloon across. I usually do a, a three minute inflation at nominal. Okay, and that's and that's enough for hemostasis too. Usually, because these patients are are very diseased, um, uh, but I try not to do really prolonged inflations. Uh, sometimes you need a little bit of light manual pressure post that balloon angioplasty to really get true true seal. Got it. Yeah, you know that's really interesting because we we talk about access a lot, you know, and getting into the vessel, but we don't talk that much about how you take down these alternative access sites. That's a really yeah. important thing. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I I was talking to. Dr. Engel the other day and 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 we were talking about the what our favorite parts of a of a PAD case are or mm -hmm. a, a CTO. And um, you know, my my own bias is that my interest really drops off <laughs> after we get through and through access. <laughs> yeah. After you've established access, I feel like that's the best part of the procedure is over, <laughs> even though that's you know, you still have all of the treatment. You still yeah. have to completely open. You have to drop stents. You have to close everything. But my interest just, oh, it it drops off so precipitously. And so <laughs> I I recognize that about myself. And I know that I need to still stay engaged because, but it's, that's the funnest part of the procedure is because yeah. once you get through and through, then you're like, oh man, then we didn't <laughs> think we could do that. Now look at that. But there's still a lot of work to be done and you can't, uh, you can't just kind of be happy with just getting across, you have to actually treat it and then actually de-access everything and, and do it appropriately. <laughs> you should just the last thing out. you want to do. Yeah. <laughs> let just... your fellow do the rest of the case. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and they, uh, uh, there are many times where these cases aren't exactly short, um, and uh, but you really do need to be very vigilant because you can put in a lot of work and then just with a, a couple mistakes... Uh, really hose a, a lot of your your runoff vessels and take away all that work that you just did and, and turn a long segment CTO into a long segment CTO revasque with embolectomy uh, mm, yeah. or with uh, reestablishing access in the uh, the retrograde access. So um, you really, even though I joke about my interest waning, you really do need to to be very cognizant of all the all the procedural steps that take place between getting access through and through and and actually wrapping it up. You brought me to a really important question. In private practice, sometimes there's a lot of pressure to do cases fast. Um, and mm -hmm. I would like to know any techniques you have or suggestions to make these cases run more efficiently. Mm. Uh, so that is a, a really good point. You know, we have the luxury um, of being in an academic setting where, you know, we take time to teach and, and we we allow uh, uh, the the procedure to take a little bit longer than than it normally would because we're we're training and um, that's a uh, not only are we training fellows and, and residents but we have medical students and we have a technologist uh, a training program so all the technologists are learning along with the process so it, it is probably a lot more steps or not a lot more steps but a, a lot more involved when we're in an academic setting. That being said. Um, we still have to uh, get through the day's cases and we still have to um, uh, try and get everyone out on time. Uh, so some some things that I feel have been helpful are um, making sure the foot is prepped before um, the uh, before the case is started. That sets uh, the so tone, I, right? Everybody yeah, knows Yeah, and I always, now. it not only does it, it set the tone, but I feel like it wards off evil spirits. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I tell the techs every time, they say, do you want to prep the foot? And I say, it's like bringing an umbrella. Uh, you bring it just in case and you prep the foot just in case. So it's almost, it's anytime we have a, a CTO that's longer than like a centimeter, I haven't prepped the foot okay. uh, because you never know uh, when uh, you're not going to be able to uh, get back across. And most of the time we don't use it and that's okay, uh, but at least the foot is prepped and it's ready. So it, it saves a lot of time kind of in that in between waiting for the foot to get prepped and all those things that, that saves time. Other things that uh, are probably more important, knowing when to try a different technique. So uh, not just doing the same thing over and over and over, uh, knowing that uh, you need to abandon anti-grade uh, attempts and go from retrograde and try and create subinimal planes, um, knowing that your subinimal planes aren't meeting and when to get more aggressive. Um, and that comes with experience. Um, you know, it's, it, it takes time to, to learn um, the angiographic signs of, of, or the signs that you're, of your wire and catheter action. Uh, that are uh, indicating to you that it's not going to be successful from above, and, and that comes with experience. But uh, I think knowing when to move on and, and when to step up the level of aggressivity is is probably the biggest uh, time saver. 
Does your pre-procedure imaging and looking at cap morphology help you kind of dictate, oh, I'm going to oh. give up pretty easily or I'm going to I'm going to We've been pursuing. going at this for 30 minutes and I thought that we were going to uh, not have you to talk about I, cap morphology. You thought I was going to skip cap morphology. Come uh, on, man. I was I was praying that she would. I don't so I don't really believe in cap morphology. OK. All right, well, let me rephrase that because it makes it sound like I yeah. don't believe that there are caps that look different. You're an anti-cap um, I, morphologist. I, I, I yes, I, I believe that there are ways that a cap can look um, mm -hmm. and look different from other caps, but I do not believe. Um, I don't think that the the evidence within the literature is sound evidence of any um, that would make me uh, that would change my approach to a CTO case based on on the appearance of the cap. Uh, rather, I think that there are sometimes uh, you're successful from uh, uh, anti-grade subminimal and spontaneous crossing. Sometimes you're not. And I don't think the cap plays any role in that. Okay. All right. All right. Sorry. We had to talk about it. It was there. Yeah. Yeah. Done. <laughs> I feel like I need to cleanse myself after that and move on. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about uh, patency for these revascularizations. Okay. Uh, first of all, do you only do this in CLI patients or do you ever do it in claudicans? Yeah, so that's that's tough, right? Um, because uh, there are um, uh, sometimes we have these patients that are um, that don't have any wounds and and they have a, a, a severe claudication. Um, they've uh, gone through the exercise program and 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 they uh, may be adequate bypass candidates, and uh, we're unable to cross from above. And and what do we do in in those cases? You know, I think I feel that. Um, the traditional teaching uh, would be that we should not uh, get retrograde access on those patients because there's uh, such a high risk of of burning your um, burning your retrograde access uh, and uh, taking a patient that's a claudicant and, and turning them into a, a CLTI patient. And I don't think that risk is is minimal now, but I think it's less than what it used to be. Um, and I think that our level of comfort with retrograde access, I think given the the literature and the supporting evidence of, of retrograde access, I think we can be more aggressive in uh, doing safari in patients that aren't necessarily CLTI patients. Uh, maybe these are patients that don't, um, that may be bypass candidates, uh, but don't have a good vein conduit. Um, and then they're looking at either um, cryovane or uh, PTFE, uh, and those patency rates are going to be very high. And I think uh, your risk benefit ratio changes in those scenarios. Um, and uh, then you may consider doing a retrograde access. Uh, but it's um, our approach is very multidisciplinary. Um, so I think that uh, warrants a conversation um, with your friendly neighborhood vascular surgeon um, and to uh, determine if they would be a good bypass candidate or not. Um, and so I think it's a that's a good opportunity to load the boat and make sure that you're uh, doing the right thing in the in the interest of the patient. I see. Okay. And then um, you mentioned the data. Can you go into that a little bit about long-term patency and how we can kind of use that to support doing these longer procedures? Yeah. So um, the uh, huge caveat to, to all the data, um, you know, I think that um, the patency rates are are quite high. There's a, a recent article in JBIR from, I think, just 2020 um, that uh, looked at over 200 uh, limbs and uh, found major amputation rates of or freedom from uh, major amputation uh, greater than 80 percent extended out to two years um so i think the the freedom from major amputation and the patency rates are are fairly high however a huge caveat that these are they're a very diverse patient population and the um, factors that lead to patency and to, to limb salvage are multifactorial and not necessarily always related to the procedure that we have performed uh, for example, are they? How long is the uh, CTO that you've revascularized? What type of um, stent did you place? Was it a drug eluding stent? What was the health of the underlying vessel? Uh, was there a significant amount of atherosclerotic calcification? What was the uh, runoff like? Was was it a two vessel runoff? One vessel runoff? Was there a significant amount of calcification? Did we have a um, complete peel loop? There's all sorts of things. So it's it's hard to look at just these patients that have had a safari and determining the um, efficacy of that procedure in that patient population with the numbers that we have. We'd need a much larger uh, database to look at with a more consistent approach to treatment of these in terms of establishing luminal gain with either stent, angioplasty, drug-looting stent, et cetera. Um, so the, the variables are, are 
too great to really draw any significant conclusions. That being said, in this patient population, um, I think that it, uh, Safari has been a complete game changer for um, for uh, 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 limb salvage and has shown uh, uh, a lot of very, very good results in, in this patient population that doesn't really have a lot of other options. Perfect. Yeah. As so much of what we do in IR, right, we either deal with really healthy patients or we deal with people who are on death's door, I feel like. And and a lot of times what we're doing is is kind of like a last ditch effort, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think it um, that goes back to Dr. Spinoza when he kind of started doing this technique is and and this is really kind of speaks to the the spirit of of IR is that he went to our, our surgical colleagues and he said hey you know all those patients that we tried to uh, revascularize and they're not good surgical candidates and they're um and we failed endovascularly and uh, they're going to go for amputation you know those types of patients send them to me give me give us one last attempt to try and save their limb and that's how uh, that the safari technique was created is that type of patient population that had no other options. And there are innumerable um, examples of that within interventional radiology of, of interventional radiologists creating new uh, techniques um, and um, using that to help a patient population that has no other real options um, and uh, completely revolutionizing uh, the way we provide care. That's very well put, Luke. Excellent. I didn't even write it down. That just, that just <laughs> was up here. You're very fresh in the morning. You, you talk very well. You speak very eloquently. I understand why we always have morning conference in the morning. Right? Well, I, I wake up at four. I, I, yeah, I, you're still so doing that. This is like midday for me. I remember working night float and you would send me an email like at four. And I'd be like, what is wrong with this guy? Why is he awake? Why is he texting me about, why is he messaging me That's... about research products at f- projects at four o'clock? Because because that's my me time. That's when, yeah. I, that's, when that's when I'm productive. <laughs> we talked a little bit about new techniques that you've developed kind of over the past couple of years to refine your management interprocedurally. Um, anything else new that you've you've really caught on to and said, man, I, I really like this. It's worked for me more times than not. It's something that I want to incorporate into my practice. Well, we spoke about gun sight, and and I think that has has made a difference um, for uh, some of these uh, safaris that are would mm-hmm. uh, where we were otherwise would would fail, and um, and I think refining that technique has something that is still a work in progress, and uh, these these patients and these procedures don't come around very frequently, just because we're we've we've gotten pretty facile at, at doing safari, so it's it's really rare um, that we. Uh, have one in which in which we fail, but I think kind of refining that t- technique has been as is like I said, still a work in progress, and it's not as like an like most interventional radiologists. I wouldn't say I'm a I'm a I'm a thinker. Um, you know, you usually <laughs> come up with an idea, about. and then <laughs> and then and then um and then you uh you 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 think oh that that makes sense. I think this would yeah. this would work, and and this would be effective. Um, but one of the things that, w- that, you know, we didn't consider at first was, uh, the direction of, of where you place your anti-grade and retrograde snares, the direction that you approach with your needle and whether that makes sense from a hemodynamic standpoint. For example, if your, uh, snare from the anti-grade access was, uh, located posteriorly in the vessel and your snare from the, uh, anti-grade or from the retrograde access was located anteriorly within the vessel, um, then you want your anti-grade snare to be, um, proximal, uh, to your, retrograde snare and to approach it from a caudal to cranial fashion to make the most sense hemodynamically. Okay. Um, otherwise, you're going to have some funky right angle or uh, your vessel is going to make some, yeah, make, uh, uh, you can't, you can't see what Allie did, but she just did a check mark. And yes, your vessel would do something like that. <laughs> and you want it to have a nice normal flow. Um, and likewise, like when we first started doing it, I put the needle across and I uh, snared one of the wire and then I went to go snare the other side and pull it through the retrograde. And I was like, well, this is going to be really traumatic. Um, and so uh, we're going to drag the back end of a wire out through a tibial vessel and a CLTI patient that needs every bit of their runoff. Um, and what should we do with that? And so we uh, uh, snared the wire from the anti-grade axis, pulled it all the way through, leaving about 5 cm of wire out percutaneously. And then we uh, took a catheter and uh, ran it all the way down that snared wire and then out through the percutaneous access and then flipped the wire around. Um, so then we could grab the floppy end from the uh, retrograde access and pull that through so it was less traumatic on the tibial. And so we, we, 
you know, have learned little things like that over the course of, of doing these procedures. Awesome. So I think it's more about technique refinement, not necessarily game changers in, in, in like the safari was. Um, yeah. But I think it's more just continued refinement of the technique. Perfect. Yeah. <clears throat> well put. What's your, what's your follow up for these patients? Um, usually we do uh, four, uh, four weeks, 12 weeks and six months. And then every six months thereafter until we get kind of two years. Um, I usually do um, ABIs and arterial duplex studies, and uh, and it's more clinical follow up. So it's really really important that these patients are kind of maximized on on medical therapy, maximized on um, blood pressure management, on um, lipid lowering, on uh, smoking cessation, et cetera. And all of those can be very challenging, especially smoking cessation with with our patient population. Um, so we have a, a close relationship with our vascular medicine colleagues to make sure these patients are uh, uh, medically optimized. And it also requires a, a close follow-up with our uh, wound care clinic to make sure these patients are getting adequate wound care. And so th- while the uh, ABIs and, and arterial duplex are, are important, it's more, it's more medical management, making sure that their wound is actually healing and clinical follow-up. Yeah, I care a little bit less about uh, exactly how that arterial duplex looks and what the velocities are going through if their uh, wound is is clearing up and, and looks like it's making progress. So uh, that's the kind of main driver for us. What do you think your re-intervention rate is on safari patients? Oh, I would say it's 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 not low. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, a lot of these patients, they have really advanced disease, and, and so they may develop uh, uh, new ulcers. Uh, they may develop a disease on the contralateral limb that requires uh, intervention. So uh, these are, we usually have a well-established relationship with this patient population, and um, they do require a reintervention either for instant restenosis uh, or uh, for uh, new lesions and, and new revascularization procedures. So it's pretty high. Okay. Yeah. That's what I figured. Same same yeah. for me, but wanted to make sure I wasn't doing something wrong. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> it's not me. It's them. No. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what do you do? Um, what's your antiplatelet or anticoagulation regimen post-procedure? Um, we do a uh, dual antiplatelet uh, therapy for three months, um, mm-hmm. and uh, then we uh, back down to single antiplatelet agent after those three months. Got it. All right, Luke. Well, we've we've talked about the basics of Safari. Um, I think our audience has got a, a handle on what to do if they're thinking about starting to do this procedure or offer it in their practice, or if they just want to refine what they're doing currently. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Um, no, I'd just like to reinforce that the person getting into uh, uh, the interventional radiologist is kind of getting into safari and wants to make that part of their established technique. You really need to have it in your head that every lesion can be crossed. Every CTO can be crossed and, and you should prove it to yourself that it, that it can't uh, before you give up. And I know it can be challenging in, um, especially in the private practice environment where throughput is important, but every single lesion can be crossed and just requires uh, trying new techniques and, and stick to it and a little bit of grit. Awesome. Thank you so much, Luke. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon, with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness Smith-Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Anne Dang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.